Dr. Grandin, thank you so much for talking to us during National Autism Awareness Month. You recently gave two talks here at your home university, Colorado State University, and the topics of one of those addresses was the world needs all kinds of minds. Why is this an important message during National Autism Awareness Month? Well, as a person with autism, I'm an absolute total visual thinker. Visual thinking is a continuum. One end of the spectrum, you have someone like me, where everything I think about is a specific visual picture. In the HBO movie, there's a scene where a whole bunch of shoes come up in rapid succession. When I design cattle handling facilities, I can actually test run them in my head. But it's important to have different kinds of minds, because different kinds of minds are good at different things. Like, for example, in scientific research, what I'm good at is visualizing the methods of an experiment. Are the methods of this experiment really being done in such a way that it's not confounded? Because I can actually see the cattle or other animals in my mind. Then you need to have the mathematician kind of thinker to do the statistics. But you need to have both kinds of minds to get good projects. Dr. Grandin, you've designed humane livestock handling systems that are used by the largest producers and processors in the world. Please tell us about a couple designs, and maybe the ones that you think in particular are the most influential. Well, I designed a piece of equipment called the Center Track Conveyor Restrainer System. Half of all the cattle in North America are handled in this piece of equipment when they go to meat plant. Um, I've designed curved handling systems. But the other thing I've really worked on is you got to get rid of the things that cows are afraid of. Reflections on wet floors, chains hanging down, seeing people up ahead, air blowing on them. It's too dark. Another big project I worked on was the uh, Im implementing okay. auditing that was done by McDonald's, Wendy's, and other hamburger companies. And I came up with five simple things to measure. And they're outcomes mm -hmm. of a lot of other problems. Like, for example, to pass the audit, only 1% of the cattle is allowed to fall. You see, you want to measure the things that, that, can, that can measure a multitude of problems. They're called critical control points. Would it be fair to say then that it's partly your mind and the, the pictures, the, the visual things that you see that are similar to animals that have had as much impact? When I first started out working with cattle in the early 70s, um, the idea of looking in a chute and seeing what cattle were seeing, people thought that was just crazy. Okay, I mean, it's, it's now it just seems like common sense. But, they, I, you know, mo I, I, I didn't know that most people didn't think visually. You are known as someone who's constantly working. What can you tell us about your next big idea or the next big challenge you're working on that will really have a significant impact on the food industry? Well, we need to be getting young people interested in hands-on things. I'm very concerned about how the schools have taken out all the hands-on classes. A lot of the kids that are the visual thinkers, they're just getting addicted to video games, they're just getting in trouble and things like that because they don't have a good teacher to get them turned around. What turned me around in high school when I wasn't studying was my science teacher. If I hadn't had my science teacher, I wouldn't have gotten a PhD, I wouldn't have gone to graduate school, I wouldn't have done a lot of things. Talking about the hands-on or the lack of it, you teach a livestock handling class here at CSU, and you also lecture on animal ethics. Of course, you work closely with graduate students in the Department of Animal Sciences, too. What are some of the key ideas that you hope to convey to your students? I really want to emphasize, get students to be more observant. What's the horses or the cows' eyes doing? The eyes are bugging out and you see the whites of their eyes, your animal's starting to get upset. Horses and cattle switching the tail, your animal's starting to get fearful and upset. Another thing I have my students do is actually lay out and design a cattle handling facility from a real job. And no, it's not a multiple choice question. It's not a fill in the blanks. They gotta figure out how to do it. And I've had some students say to me, well, you're too vague about it. Well, you kind of got to read the book and you got to kind of figure it out. You know, and we need to teach problem solving skills. You get very excited, Dr. Grandin, when you're talking about your class and the things that you cover in your class. What is the most rewarding thing for you about teaching or what do you like most? Oh, I love it when somebody says, well, I designed one of the corral systems and it really worked. Or we just used some of your pointers on handling cattle and it really worked. Then I go out and I do autism talks. I've had parents write to me and say, my child went to college because of your book. I've had young people on the spectrum write to me and, and the movie really motivated them to succeed. One of the things about autistic kids, you always gotta push them a little bit. Just a little bit past the comfort zone to keep them developing. Reading your books and listening to your talks, it's clear that you've endured teasing and ridicule as a person with autism. 
but it's also clear that certain people in your life have really helped you. I mean, the worst time of my life was high school. And the only places where I could get away from teasing were the specialized activities, riding horses, model rockets club, and electronics lab. And, and when I first went in the cattle industry, yes, there were people that put bull testicles on my car. There were people that were really mean to me, but they also were some people that really helped me, like Ted Gilbert, the manager of the Red River Feed Yard, and that's the Red River Feed Yard, as in John Wayne's feed yard. Um, there was Jim Uhl, a contractor who seeked me out because he, he knew my talents and I did a lot of projects with him. There were good people that helped me. And one of the things I had to learn is I had to sell my skill rather than myself. And when I showed off my drawings, they go, wow, you did that? Then maybe, um, maybe they would talk to me. You often discuss the importance of identifying strengths with students that have autism disorders, then matching those strengths with fields of study and potential careers, as you just did. Can you elaborate on that just a little more? Well, let's think about careers for visual thinkers. Good careers for visual thinkers, anything to do with industrial design. How about uh, kind of graphics, animation, uh, anything to do with any kind of visual media. Uh, things like training animals, doing photography, um, maybe putting up all the AV equipment for big conventions. Okay, then our pattern thinkers, our music and math minds. These kids are going to be great at programming, engineering, uh, mathematics, statistics, all kinds of these kinds of, uh, of things. And again, in designing a lot of tight tech products, we need to have the combination of the industrial designer and the electronics and the engineering kind of mind. And then you've got people that are the word thinkers. They make really good journalists, very good at record keeping. Uh, they'd be very good working in a lab, just making sure your data doesn't get mixed up. We need to be working on finding jobs in the area of strength. So that goes back to what you were, what you mentioned earlier, and the people who took interest in you, and your mother who encouraged you to build skills in other areas. Is that responsibility? In, on an educator or is it on a parent? Where does the, the responsibility initially lie? Teachers and parents need to work together. And the thing is, you've got to push these kids some. Otherwise, they're not going to develop. No surprises, surprises scare. The mother was always pushing me to do new things. When I was 15, I was afraid to go to my aunt's ranch. The choice I had was one week or all summer. I wasn't allowed not to go, you know, there was another parent told me that her child was scared to go to sleepaway camp. Well, he got to sleepaway camp and he, find out, he found out he just loved it. You know, scared to try new things. You always got to push a little bit, but no surprises because that causes panic. So in our conversations, one thing that I sense from you all the time is that you're always learning, you're always seeking, you're always reading new literature, new research on, on a wide variety of topics. Is that one characteristic in and of itself that's really contributed to your success? See, a person with autism always keeps learning. People have told me my talks at 60 are better than my talks at 50. You see, I'm a bottom-up thinker. I have to learn everything by specific examples. So the more things I get out and see stuff, you know, when I first started out in livestock handling, I went to every feed yard in Arizona and I worked cattle. So the more stuff I could see, I could see where this facility worked, really well. This place had a nice loading ramp, the other place had a nice sorting pen, and then I could start, you know, putting the pieces together. Dr. Grandin, thank you so much for taking the time to visit today. Really appreciate your, your insight. It was great to be here.